you open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20 as we look at the first 16 verses together uh, this morning. As you make your way to Matthew chapter 20, I just want to acknowledge we're four weeks into a sermon series that we began uh, where we're looking at parables that describe the kingdom of God. Uh, Chuck Smith, uh, one of the pastors, part of Calvary Chapel, started the Calvary Chapel movement. He told pastors uh, who were young in ministry, he said, stay away from Revelation early in ministry and stay away from the parables early in ministry. And four weeks in, uh, I can just say there's a, there's a unique nature to preaching through the parables. And the only confidence I have week to week as I stand before you is that the tomb is empty. And so Jesus has defeated sin, Satan, and death. And God's word is alive and active and inspired and And so uh, my hope every week is that we can faithfully consider these parables that Jesus gave us regarding the nature of his kingdom. My hope as we're looking at these parables is that we would recapture the mission, vision, values of our church, which are hopefully the mission, vision, values that reflect the kingdom of God. We began this sermon series looking at the, the surpassing worth of the king of the kingdom. Uh, that, that when we see the worth of the king, we can give our life to something that is worthy. And we do so through the second week we looked at the kingdom of God advancing through the sowing of seeds. Now, the parable speaks of four different soils that the seed would land on, but, but the, the, the participation that comes from us being a part of the kingdom work is, is we sow the seeds and we trust that God will use the seed, which is the word of God, landing on the four different soils, and, and in time, God would take that seed and he would allow it to take root and, and bear good fruit. Last week, we looked at how it is that we can participate, and we considered the parable of the talents, and I just want to acknowledge and hopefully correct if there's been any air thinking and talk uh, in life groups this week or even proceeding regarding the parable of the talents, a stewardship of a life is far more than stewarding your tithe, although uh, we should steward our resources. Uh, God has entrusted to you your life. And this morning, as we get to Matthew chapter 20, my, my hope is this. If you walked away from last week's sermon and you're like, where, where's, where's the fourth servant, the one who, the one who, who waste, gave, gave all of, of his talent and, and didn't see a return? My hope is, is that this week we'll, we'll balance that as we consider that the victory ultimately belongs to the king. And we, as participants through proximity, get to rejoice in the kingdom work. As we come to Matthew chapter 20, we're going to see another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like, it's going to be a master who hires laborers and then sends them into the vineyard. We're going to see different types of laborers who are commissioned into the labor, in, uh, uh, laboring in the vineyard, and we're going to see different responses to this call and to this commission. Just want to acknowledge as we get to this parable uh, that there's kind of two ways that pastors and preachers, teachers typically hand this text. One uh, pastor preacher would handle it from the perspective that this parable is related to salvation and that even in the 11th hour, salvation could be made known to you. And in those last minutes of life, salvation could be found by you, by grace, through faith in Christ alone. And I think that's a good handling of this text. I also think some pastors handle this text and they they describe it as a kingdom work and service and that there's ways that we might be a part of the kingdom work early in life and, and others might be idle throughout life and get to the end of their life and feel like they've wasted their life and, and yet there's still time for them to participate in the kingdom work. And so you say, which way are you going to handle the text, Pastor Will? I'll say, well, I, I think the principle carries both for kingdom participation and for kingdom salvation. And so I'd say, yes, Amen to both of those pastors who might handle the text differently. We're going to see four warnings, two warnings from the first laborers and two warnings from the latter laborers. And my hope is, is as we see these warnings, we would see a commonality shared among humanity, insight on the human heart and the way it is that we oftentimes deal with the 
the things of God and, and in receiving these warnings that we might become people who find great joy in participation, serving at the pleasure of our King. I encourage you to follow along Matthew chapter 20, looking at the first 16 verses together. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into the vineyard. So pause right there. Nothing really to, to speak of other than this. A, a denarius is a day's wage. And so in, in uh, first century in Rome, it was the wage that was given to a soldier for a day's work. Uh, some, some scholars and commentators uh, suggest that with a denarius, you could have a place to stay, you could have food to eat, and that you could have two glasses of wine. Uh, just simply speaking to this idea that the provisions for the day uh, are covered by a denarius. It's, it's not a wage that's going to make you rich, but it's not a wage that's going to leave you without. And so the, the, the master comes to these laborers and, and makes an agreement with these laborers. He says, a, de- a denarius a day, a day's wage, and he sent them into the vineyard. They obviously agreed to it because they go out and they, they work in the vineyard. Verse 3, and going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give to you. So just kind of pause right there. So there's a contract with the first, way, uh, first laborers that there's going to be a denarius that's given to them for their day's work. There's a second group of, of laborers, third hour, who he sees standing idle in the marketplace. And he doesn't say, I'm going to give you a day's wage. He just says, I'll give you what's fair. So you go out into the, the vineyard and you work too. I'll give you what's right. Verse 4. So they went out and going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and he found others standing. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. And he said to them, you too go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And then those who were hired about the eleventh hour, they came. So you, you, you can imagine that in, in the modern construct of vocation, that if you came in the 11th hour, the 11th hour is synonymous at the last minute. They came at the last minute. The, the work day is almost over, and you would imagine that they might receive a, a different wage than those who had begun to labor at the beginning of the morning. And he calls the last first, and, and as he calls them before him, each of them receive a denarius. Verse 10, now those who hired first, they thought that they would receive more. But each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at their master of the house, saying, the last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and who have been a part of the scorching heat, worked in the scorching heat. And he replied to uh, one of them, friend, I am doing no wrong to you. Did you agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as, as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Four warning, warnings, two from the first laborers. The first warning is, is this. Entitlement is a thief. It steals from us the ability to see what we have. These, these, first, these first laborers had been given the wage. They had been given the reward. They had been able to participate in the master's work with, within the vineyard. Everything that had been agreed upon in, in the morning, they received in, in full. This is, the, this is to the master's surprise at the end of the day that, that what they had received wasn't, wasn't sufficient for them. It was sufficient for them at the beginning of the day, but at the end of the day, they, 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 they allow entitlement to in creep in, into their thinking, and the entitlement prevents them from seeing the, the, the reward that they had received from from the master entitlement oftentimes shows up look at what we've done and therefore we should receive and that's exactly what happens with these first laborers they're hired and they stand before the master and they say the last only worked hour and you've made them equal to us and yet we look at what we've done we've borne the burden of the day And because all they're looking at is the thing that they think that they deserve, they can't see what they actually have. Prevents them from rightly perceiving what God had given to them and entrusted to them. The the second warning that I would give to you from these first labors, not only is entitlement a thief that 
that robs from us, steals from us the ability to see what we have. But comparison is a thief that steals from us the joy that comes through participation. And so you have entitlement that blinds you to perceive what God's entrusted to you and given to you. And then you have, then you have comparison that steals the joy that comes from participating in, in the work of God. I think it's Teddy Roosevelt, or most people attribute it to Teddy Roosevelt, that, that comparison is the thief of, of joy. This is the idea that they're, they're trying to communicate or that Teddy Roosevelt's trying to communicate. That, that when we begin to compare ourselves to other people, it robs us of, of the joy that's intended to be ours. So not only do they feel entitled because of the work that they had done, they begin to compare their work to the work of those around them. And that immediately robs them of finding the joy of being able to participate in laboring in the vineyard. This is a reflection of the human heart, is it not? Like this is what makes this parable so startling and shocking. And, and we can turn to narratives within scripture that gives us insight on how this shows up in real time and in real places. I'm going to read for you some select text out of 1 Samuel chapter 30. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there because we'll be there for a minute. The, the story of 1 Samuel 30 reveals this same state of the human heart. What happens is Israel is uh, ransacked. Women, children, and resources are, are taken. And so David and, and 600 soldiers set out to reclaim their, the, the ladies who were kidnapped and the children who were kidnapped and, and to reclaim the, the resources that had been taken from the city. And you get to verse 9 of 1 Samuel chapter 30, and it says that David sets out with 600 men who were with them. They come to the brook Besor, and uh, that there were those who were with them who were left behind, and they stayed. Verse 10, but David pursued, he and 400 men. But 200 men, they stayed behind. Why? Because they were too exhausted to cross the brook of Besor. And, and, and so you can kind of begin to see the parallels. So you got 400 men going with David to war to reclaim what was rightfully Israel's. You got 200 men who are too exhausted, too worn out. They come to the brook and, and they're like, we, we can't go on, King David. And so David says, you can stay there. Fast forwarding to verse 21, David came to the 200 men after they had gone and, and brought back to Israel what was theirs. And he comes to the 200 men who had been too exhausted to follow David and who had been left at the brook of Besor. And they said, uh, they went out to meet David and met the people who were with him. And when David came near to greet them, all the wicked and worthless fellows among the men who had gone with David, this is what they said. Can you imagine what, what the, the 400 men who go, went and, and put their life on the line, who went to reclaim what was rightfully Israel's, can you, can you imagine what they said to the 200 that didn't go with them? Here's what they said. Because they did not go with us, we will not give them any of the spoil that we have recovered, except that each man may lead away with his wife and his children and that they might go home got some laborers that work all day. They agree to a denarius. You got some laborers that work the last hour of the day and, and they get a denarius. Like th this, this is the tension with the human heart. That, that we, we believe that somehow that the victory belongs to us. And David's response gives some profound insight. David says to them, you will not do so, my brothers. With what the Lord has given us, he's the one that's preserved us. And he's the one that's given into our hand the band that has come against us. And so you have, you have 400 men who their perspective is, we went out to war and we won a victory. You got one, one man, King David, who went out to war with 400 men. And he comes back and he says, God's the one that won for us the victory. And we can quickly think that we're entitled when we believe that we hold the victory. But when God holds the victory, we begin to recognize that he can choose to do with what belongs to him, whatever he wants. And this is his response to the workers who are entitled and who are comparing their work to the work of another. And this shift in thinking profoundly changes the way that we interact with our circumstances. Here's how this perspective shift shows up initially and how when we come to find our delight in Christ and our joy in participating in the work of God, here's how our tone will shift. Our tone early, apart from uh, a, a right delighting in Christ and a joy in, in finding that we're participating uniquely, our tone initially shows up 
Why are we, why are we in, in such a difficult region? I've heard, heard pastors say. I've even, I've even contributed to that. Why am I in such an expensive county? Why am I in a, in a place where there's such opposition to the gospel and where the values of Christianity aren't shared by my neighbors? It shows up in an entitlement, in a comparison. I'm looking at pastors in the South and, and pastors in other parts of the world, and they don't have to worry about the, the things that I'm worried about. I, I hear this among pastors. I've even contributed to this as a pastor. And, and this is a tone of entitlement and comparison that strips me of finding the joy in the delight that is mine, knowing what God has given to me. And then the the proximity that comes from participating in that work, the joy in participating in that work, the tone shifts later when we change our perspective and we begin to see that it's a delight. Our tone shifts to thank you, Lord, for entrusting me with such a difficult task. Difficult task, but I praise God that he entrusted me with a full day's work. Praise God. Someone asked me when we moved out here, like, how long do you plan, plan to be here? I, I think there were two things that they were communicating. One, that a lot of churches come and go. <laughs> Some of you have experienced that. Two, they were, they were asking, am I, a, am I a guy that's going to go plant churches all around the Northwest? Am I, am I here for a little while and, and gone? And here's, here's how I responded, and I still think it's a fair response. There's more than a lifetime of work to be done in this region. Whether the Lord leaves me here for, for a lifetime or not is, is dependent on him. But like, thank you, Lord, that you've given me a full day's work. I, I, don't, ha- I don't have to look somewhere else to, to find gospel need. I just look across the street or down the road or, or into North Seattle with our friends in Epic Life Church. Like, like the tone shifts. All of a sudden, it's, it's no longer a burden that I've been a laborer all day, but it's a blessing. Like, Lord, thank you for giving me proximity to the tough work so that I can see a God who's bigger than the tough work. Tone, the tone shifts. Sometimes shows up in our language. Why am I always the, the last person to leave? And be left with final cleanup. Any, any moms feel that way at home? <laughs> you, you can even feel that way within the church or, or within the workplace. Like, why am I the person that seems to see the mess and, and I'm the one that's always left cleaning up the mess? Like, I seem to be working much more than the people around me. It's a comparison game. I, I, I had a long day, a long week. My life's not easy. I don't have a lot of margin entitlement game. That's, that's, that's the tone when we have comparison entitlement leading us, but the tone after we recognize the blessing of working for the Lord, the tone shows up. That, Thank you, Lord, for giving me the ability to, to make this space more beautiful. As, as Jenny just reminded us, like, it honors God to make a space more beautiful. If you're cleaning your home, like, it's honoring God to provide a place that, that gives rest to your, to your family, refuge to, to your family. If you're, if you're cleaning up the church because you saw trash on the ground, like it's not a, why didn't they pick up the trash? But praise God that I saw the trash and I get to be one who contributes and, and participates in making this space more beautiful for the glory of Jesus and for the advancement of his kingdom. You're like, really? Like just trash a part of that? Absolutely. This is, this is what I mean when I say it's a life to be stewarded. Not just 10% of our resources to be a steward, but like every part of our life, whether you eat, whatever you eat, whatever you drink, whatever you do, all is to be done for the, for the glory of God. And God finds glory even in the small things, maybe especially in the small things that are despised by the people around us. Sometimes shows up in our tone if entitlement and comparison is what leads us. Why have I, why have I been so disciplined and worked so hard but experienced such little success? Like that person down the street, like, look at, look at their success. Look at, look at their platform. Look at, look, pastors, look at their budget. Look at the resources that have been entrusted to them. Our tone after shows up, thank you, Lord, for teaching me the value of discipline and hard work. Help me to find joy in the process of you making me more like Jesus. It's not about the platform or, or the budget. It's about being made into the likeness of our Savior, who is Jesus the quote that's been circulating on the video over the last few weeks, I've been anxious to, to share it with you be, because I imagine some of you have read the first line but I haven't gotten to the second line. Charles Spurgeon says this, one of the greatest rewards that we receive for serving God is the permission to still do more for him. I got to work a whole day in the vineyard of my master. What delight comes that I got the permission to give a whole day to my master. You see that there, there's a shift in perspective. It's, it's no longer, oh, poor me, that I'm, I'm in the field working, but I'm blessed that the master would call me into the field 
to work. And the one who gets called at the 11th hour, praise God that they got to participate, but wouldn't it have been a greater joy if they had the whole day to labor in the vineyard for the master? If you've been walking with Jesus for a while, can I maybe frame this statement in the form of a question? Do you see the reward that God has given you in giving you permission to still do more for him? Like, I, I get that people who've walked with the Lord up into their, their, their senior years of life, they've given sacrificially to the church. They've given sacrificially to the community. They've given sacrificially to the kingdom. And, and some may have given sacrificially to, to churches that are no longer around. And I just, I just want to say it to you, like, like God has given you the blessing and given you permission to still do more for him because he's still given you breath. What a sacred privilege that God gives us life and energy to go to the battle so that we can see his victory, to go to the places that are difficult and share his hope. To be clear, 1 Samuel chapter 30 gives us permission to rest. And in 1 Samuel chapter 30, it says that there's no shame in the rest. 200 soldiers stayed at the river and they rested, but neither is there any place for entitlement just because of participation. The 400 that went to war, the blessing that was theirs was that they had proximity to the battle so that they might delight in the victory that the Lord had brought to their life. And, and this, this seems to be what Jesus is trying to communicate in this parable, that, that the work is, is, is not a burden, but, it, but it's a blessing. And, and the story of 1 Samuel gives us a, a descriptive narrative that God can do with 400 men, the same that he could have done with 600 men. In fact, God doesn't need any men. The point is this, that the joy of our labor comes from proximity to see God do a work that only he can do. The victory does not rest in your work, but rather it's a reflection of God's work. Second warning that comes from the final labor, or the last two warnings that come from the final labor is, is first is this, an, an idle past does not have to keep you from a productive future. Second warning, believe in Jesus and you will soon discover where it is that you belong. It's interesting that, that these latter laborers, there's no contract that's made. They just entrust themselves to the character of the master that he'll give them what is fair and when he comes to the laborers, verse 3, and then to the, the, the laborers in the, la, uh, the 11th hour, uh, verse 6, he, he describes them, the master describes them as, as being idle. Verse 3, about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the workplace. Verse 6, the last part, he says to the laborers, why do you stand here idle all day? I get, there's, a, there's a real tension the longer I live to think that the past has to dictate my future. Can you, can you imagine being the, the laborers there at the 11th hour and the master coming and saying there's a work to be done? They're like, yeah, but like, do you know what time it is? There's only an hour left in the day. Like, like do you really want to hire me to, to come be a part of your work? To which the master says, yes, go to the field and, and do the work. I think it's an interesting language that's, that's used twice over in this parable that an idle past does not have to keep us from a productive future. I'm, I'm reading a book and, and in the book they, they cite an excerpt of a sermon by a pastor named A.L. Patterson who gives a message on the person Shamgar. And in this, it's, it's speaking about kind of future change and, and managing transition and thinking through big life moments where you might change in, into the future. But these three principles, I actually think, still apply to, to the person who has an idle past and, past and, and doesn't want that to shape their future. And, and the three principles are this from this sermon on Shamgar. The first is start where you are. Second is use what you have. Third is do what you can. You may be an 11th hour worker. You may be looking in the rear view mirror and you may feel like you're stuck. And if you look at the whole of your life, you may say, man, this, this is the whole of idle activity. Like what have I done? I'm, I'm nearing 39, which I think is nearing middle age. I just told you my age. Uh, I did not understand a midlife crisis until I hit midlife. <laughs> you, you start to reflect on the, the whole of your life in, in a, a way that's different. 
than before. I, w- I wish someone had warned me of that. <laughs> You're like, is, is all my activity like idle? Is any of it meant anything? Eleventh hour is far past midlife. It's the end of life. And the master sees value to call the worker into the field. It needs harvest. The worker didn't not work because he was lazy. The text doesn't say that. The worker didn't work, according to the text, because no one hired them. They didn't know where they fit. They didn't know where they belonged. Which leads me to the second warning and and point is, if you believe in Jesus, then you will discover where it is that you belong. But there's a sequence to this. Ephesians chapter 2 says that we're dead in our trespasses and our sins, but God, rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ, that we are God's workmanship, created or recreated in Christ Jesus to do a good work. And so, sequence makes sense and is necessary. We first belong to Jesus, and then we discover the good work that God had preordained for us to walk in. To be clear, this is a parable that speaks of the generosity of a master, a master that could have split portions out and given the later laborers a different wage. But as many pastors and preachers and theologians have appropriately said, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Whether you've walked with Jesus your whole life or whether you're in the 11th hour of life. And here's, here's, a, here's a couple things to note about the final labor. He was described as idle. His lack of work was not because he was lazy, but because he didn't know where he belonged. And He was in the 11th hour, which means he was at his very last moments. Final laborer teaches us that while there is still breath in our lungs, there is still opportunity, most certainly opportunity to find salvation in Christ, but also opportunity to serve him. What we know for certain is that one day this life will be over and all of us will stand before God. And so there is an urgency in both salvation and there should be an urgency in our service. We serve a God who is not only the God of the first hour, but we serve a God who is God of the 11th hour. And therefore, nothing and no one is too late for God. We see this in the story of the thief next to Jesus on the cross. He was saved not only in in the final hours, but the final moments of his life. And he gave testimony into his final breaths that God can still work in and through him, through his profession of faith. And while this man did not get to see the fruit of his profession of faith, I just want to say that this is a go-to text for preachers throughout the centuries And this man's testimony, while he has not seen the fruit of his testimony, has borne much fruit because of the way that God has used his life. Don't give up on the plans for your life, God's plans for your life, just because of what's in your rear view mirror. A dashboard in your car is much bigger than the rear view mirror for a reason. And it reminds me of a a podcast of uh, Pastor John Piper that I was turned on to uh, year and a half or so ago from a member in our church. And this is, this is a question that's written to Pastor John, a man in his 11th hour saying, what am I to do? I'm in the 11th hour. What am I to do with a, a wasted life? Here's how the question shows up. Dear Pastor John, I haven't read your book, Don't Waste Your Life. The title is convincing enough. The fact is that I have already wasted it, or at least it feels that way. For decades, I have tried a variety of different careers, and none of them have worked. I tried starting my own business for over 20 years. While my wife worked, I earned a PhD. I moved to a country where I didn't speak the language for my wife's job, and then I had a breakdown. Several years later, my wife and I separated. I am now 64. I live in a small mobile home. I do work that any 18-year-old could do. Those are my boss's words. The company is good to me. My boss is a Christian. Side note, this isn't in the question, but if you're a Christian boss, you shouldn't be demeaning the labor of your employees. He says, I can earn a living, but each day feels nothing more than an exercise in waking up in the morning, getting through the day, and going to bed at night. What advice can you give to someone who has already wasted their life? This is an honest 11th hour question, 64 years old. I I don't know how many years I got left, and and I look back in the rearview mirror, and and it just says a, a wasted life. 
It's honest, wondering, what are we to, what are we to do with this? Par- parable of the talents doesn't, doesn't give us this person. What are, we, what are we to do if we were to take the talents and we were to invest it in something and, and the return never, never came? I just want to say it's not there because if we invest in the kingdom of God, there will be a return. You may not see it. You may not feel it. You may not experience it. It may be your children or your grandchildren. I'm convinced that that's why it's not there. But here's, here's how John Piper responds. Two excerpts from his response. He says, Well, don't waste the rest of your life by fretting over the past. God has a new dream for you that is not wasteful. Remember what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. Forget what lies behind and strain forward to what lies ahead. I press on towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Surely the reason Jesus said this, John Piper speaking, forgetting what lies behind is because the past regularly functions for us as a ball and chain around our feet. Either, either because we've failed and we feel hopeless. We're, we're, we're an 11th hour worker. We feel like there's no place for us in, in the work of, of the king. Or because we were a first hour worker and we succeed and we then find pride in our labor. Here's what, Paul, or here's what John Piper says. It's better to forget the past in that way and to dream a new dream. And then he goes on and he says, in dreaming your new dream for your life, keep in front of you this truth. How you do what you do is vastly more important in the eyes of God than what you do. This is why my, my, my view of vocation is so broad. People ask me, should I be a pastor? Should I, should I be a missionary? Should I be a teacher? Should I be a lawyer? Should I be a doctor? Should I be a homemaker? Should I be a social worker? And at the end of the day, I say, do what, whatever you, you want to do. Just honor the Lord in that vocation. How you do what you do is vastly more important in the eyes of God than what you do. And he says, I understand, John Piper speaking, I understand, I I mean, I think I can understand that having a PhD and doing what an 18-year-old can do probably feels like bad stewardship or failure. But remember, there are thousands of people with PhDs working in universities and displeasing the Lord God Almighty. More than a million of teenagers who are walking by the Holy Spirit. It is not where you work or what you do that pleases the Lord. It is whether you live by the Spirit, walk by faith, whether you pursue holiness, and whether you love people, whether you grow in grace, whether Christ is more precious to you than anything. And then he repeats himself, how you do what you do is vastly more important in the eyes of God than what you do. And so Bruce, this is the guy asking the question, John Piper in conclusion says, when I say dream a new dream, I don't know whether the Lord means for you to have a new job, and I don't care very much. Sorry. But I care enormous, enormously that you do what your hand finds to do in the name of the Lord Jesus, in love for people, and for the glory of God. For the first hour, Christian, might I warn you, comparison and entitlement will rob you of the joy of being a day laborer for the Lord. If you're an 11th hour Christian or an 11th hour person wondering how it is that you make sense of a life that seemingly is wasted, might I appeal to you the first step is surrender to Christ. And as you surrender to Christ, Scripture says He will make you a a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come, and that there's a new dream to be dreamed that isn't necessarily going to change your vocation, but... Change your heart and change your eyes. And as your heart and your eyes are changed, all of a sudden the things that you put your hand to have eternal purpose because it's no longer for the applause of man, but it's for the glory of the king. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. Uh, We're thankful for you. We're thankful that you're a God who is God of the first hour. Uh, We're thankful that you're a God who is God of the last hour. So, Lord, I pray that we would receive uh, these cautions, these warnings. For the person who's walked with you for many years, might they find the great joy and pleasure in doing more for you before you call them home. That while you have given them breath, you still have purpose for their life. There's still a good work for them to walk in. So might we not be discouraged? Might we not be dismayed. 
But might we find great joy in putting our hands to a work that our master and our king has commissioned us unto so that as laborers we might join in the work of the master inviting more people to be a part of the work but we know that there are people who have given their life to causes who may be able to even have the description of this text applied to them that it's just it's been idle Lord, may that not prevent them from seeing what could be. May the things in the past not prevent them from dreaming about how it is that you might use them and where it is that you might call them into the future. For you're not only a God of the first hour, you're a God of the 11th hour. And while there's still breath in our lungs, we can cry out to our God, call upon the name of Christ and in doing so that we might experience salvation just as the man did next to Jesus on the cross. And Lord, we may not see the fruit of that testimony, but we know that that testimony placed in your hands will accomplish all that you desire for it to accomplish. That that's a part of the good work So, Lord, we pray that you would help us see, that you give us a heart that's obedient, feet that are responsive to the ways that you desire for us to apply this text. We love you, Lord. We ask these things in your son Jesus' name.